What's up guys, welcome back to the Poker Vlog. This is episode number 71, and this is one of my favorite episodes. I go out to Portland, we play a recorded game uh, on the Poker Guys YouTube uh, channel. It's called Poker Time, so it's a 5-10 game. Insane action, uh, really cool lineup, and uh, if you guys haven't checked out the Poker Guys YouTube channel yet, you should definitely do it. They do a lot of analysis of big poker hands, and then they also have their own recorded game, which is what uh, this episode is of. So I have live footage, which I'm excited to share with you. They do a great a great uh, job of doing the commentary, so a lot of times I'll switch back and forth between my analysis and their analysis. But before we get into it, I've got an announcement to make. We did the PokerCoaching.com giveaway. That's Jonathan Little's site uh, where they have the interactive hand quizzes, which is probably the best way to learn how to play poker. Uh, some of the best players on the planet are teaching you guys how to play cash games and tournaments. Jonathan Little himself is a tournament master. Uh, he's also really good at cash games, but he's got like nearly 7 million in tournament earnings or something. So with this giveaway, everyone who entered had a chance to win a free one-year membership to the site, a one-on-one -on -one coaching session with Jonathan Little, and uh, several free poker books. So it was like a $1,000 value, which is pretty awesome. And uh, instead of having just one winner, Jonathan reached out to me yesterday and said that he would also pick four additional winners who would receive a free one-year membership, which is super cool. Uh, happy to happy to have this contest with you guys and uh, provide you some free uh, free content, free one-year memberships, poker training sites. It really is one of the best in the world. So uh, let's go ahead and get to the winners. There were three randomly chosen uh, one-year membership winners. Those are Paul, George Wolf, and Sea Bass. Not sure if it's the same Sea Bass from Dumb and Dumber, but uh, we also chose one winner who had the most entries. She was at the top of the leaderboard. You you get to the top of the leaderboard by sharing the uh, the contest with other people. So she was at the top, and that is Christine Eckert. Congratulations to you four. You're all receiving a one year membership to PokerCoaching.com. And the grand prize winner was uh, randomly selected. Let's get a drum roll. All right. Grand prize winner is Tony Lopez. Congratulations, Tony. I don't think you have any relationship to Ty Lopez, but you're going to be receiving the one-on-one -on -one coaching session, the one-year membership, and the free books. Very cool stuff. Uh, if you didn't win the contest, I imagine you're pretty bummed out, and that's understandable. But don't go into a deep state of depression. Jonathan is offering all the YouTube viewers $200 off a one-year membership. So instead of $297, it's only $97. I'll have a link below in the description box. If you use the promo code BRAD, that's how you get it. And if you sign up before October 7th, you'll receive 15 bonus stars. Those bonus stars will unlock uh, three additional training videos from Jonathan Little. Those are worth $97 each. So uh, definitely sign up for the site. One of the absolute best ways to improve your game. I highly suggest checking it out. All right, let's go ahead and get into the episode. Hope you guys enjoy it. Here at the Aloft Hotel in beautiful Portland, Oregon. Looks awesome outside. Lots of trees. Vegas doesn't have too many trees, so this is nice. Uh, anyway, Andrew and I are gonna meet up with the poker guys at Portland Meadows probably in about an hour. And uh, then we're just gonna jump in the 510 game. It's gonna be $2,400 max. So I imagine that's what we'll both buy in for. And uh, I just watched some of the other episodes, some of the prior poker times, and there's a ton of action. So it's really important to run good. We'll see what happens. It's a new session of Poker Time. We got some new players. Get ready for them, Grant. That's right. 
It's Andrew Nimi. It's Brad Owen. Vlogger superstars. There's Brad on the left and Andrew on the right. Joseph is surrounded. He's in the vlogger sandwich. Is that okay to say? I don't know. I'm not sure either. It's kind of a superstar lineup there. There's Brewer. We got Jake. We got Wonka. These guys are legit. They are. Ish. They're, they're good players. Yeah, no, they are. They're absolutely all good players. What do you mean legit-ish? Ben Proser's there's Batiste. Batiste. Won a World Series circuit event. Snuggy. He wears different kinds of shirts. <laughs> We're in an interesting game. There are quite a few players here who have had some nice tournament success. I've seen a few of them on Poker Time before, but I'm not all that familiar with how anyone plays. About a half hour into the session, I pick up King Queen Offsuit from Under the Gun. I want to play it, so I raise it up. I'll let the poker guys take it from here with the analysis. It's just like a type. Wow. No. It's Looks like uh, I mean, Brad I know is I'm white, King but Queen but under the gun here. Yeah. Cool, cool. Okay. Yeah. So it's a beer. It's more with me. Oh, yeah. and Brad's first action you know, since the first hand, really. He's going to get some bad news here. Well, he's only got 35 invested. It's fine. Wonka is, happen all I guess time. in under the gun range, Wonka is definitely anyway, going to 3-bet. Oh, yeah. Get some chips in there. I mean, the people behind him lose their minds all the time, whether you 3-bet or not. You, it's crazy not to 3 A reason the call would be in case, if, if it was <laughs> later in the session that and Snuggy really was deciding it's to like, like blast off a bit, he might be squeezing a lot there. That would be a reason to fly. He might squeeze anyway, even when you 3-bet yeah. it, though. We've seen him do it in the past. Oh, look at this. Brad wow. is not, not folding. He's 4-betting. Wow. $400. Okay. This got interesting in a hurry. He has what we call significant blockers to kings and queens. He does. He's hoping Wonka's doing this with his light side. Not but this time. Like, again, Wonka has three bet frequently like, so far. He's had it every time, but Brad yeah. hasn't seen I'll that. So the question becomes for Wonka, do we want to call or do we want to re-raise here? Re-raising really puts you like aces and kings and maybe ace, king, and maybe right. queens. That's if, it. If he five bets, he's only really going to get action from kings, I think, and queens will consider folding. Ace, king, and queens are going to have a tough spot. Kings are not going to ever fold. So Wonka decides just to call. I like I, it. I think that's a great idea. In position. I if like Brad it. has something like jacks, Brad's going to continue on boards that right. are favorable for both of your hands, and he's probably going to fold preflop if you five bet. And look at the stack to pot ratio Wonka setting up here. 1.5K with 800 in there. This is a great flop from Wonka's point of view where he knows he's ahead still almost always against Brad's four betting range. Yeah, it's hard for Brad to have quads or eights full here, and Brad does continue as he kind of has to. Brad's praying Wonka has ace-king and goes away. Or maybe some sort of light three bet that had to call because it was too good, like king-jack suited, ace-jack ace suited, something like maybe. that. Maybe. Wonka is definitely not going to fold. The question for Wonka, again, is to call or to raise. I think both are reasonable options. I think when you raise, you're kind of repping being a bad player with tens. Like, that's kind yeah. of what you're repping when you raise. So can, yeah. if Brad knows that Wonka's good, I think you have to call. If Wonka believes that Brad knows nothing about him and thinks maybe he's a fish, then he can raise effectively and maybe get it against Jax. He just moves in, so there okay. you go. So he's hoping Brad levels himself into thinking Wonka's a bad player, but right. it doesn't matter because Brad has king high instead of Jax or tens or anything like that. The truth is, Which from Brad's point of view, if he knows Wonka is a thinking player at all, then Wonka oh, always has sort of aces here. So I four bet there was a bluff. I hadn't had too much to play with up to that point, and being under the gun, I thought it'd look incredibly strong. Fortunately, I run into pocket aces, which I've read on two plus two is a really good starting hand in poker. I'm down 700 early on and not off to a great start. Several hands later, the button raises it to 60. I pick up king queen offsuit again. I don't want to flat and play out of position only for a chance to win what's already in the middle. I prefer to 3-bet and attempt to take it down preflop against the button's opening range, which is going to consist of a lot of weak hands. I make it 200. It folds back to the button. He's nearly at the top of his range and has an easy call with pocket tens. The flop comes ace-queen-5 with two hearts. We've got middle pair and some backdoor draws. I check because I should be either way ahead or way behind. It'd be tough for me to get calls from worse hands on this board, and no better hands are folding. The opponent checks back. So I believe that I probably have the best hand at this point. The turn is the nine of hearts, so I pick up a flush draw. I have to determine the right bet size. I want to get calls from hands that are worse than mine, and those hands likely won't be willing to call anything very large, so I bet 125 into 410. The opponent calls, and the river is the six of hearts, so I've got the nuts. I check, hoping my opponent will bluff if he doesn't have a heart, or will bet for value with any queen or jack of hearts. The button's 10 of hearts isn't big enough for him to feel comfortable betting. He checks back, which is reasonable. I don't get the maximum, but take down a decent sized pot. Here we're in an interesting spot. We have a player opening up from the cutoff to 40, and then the two loosest players at the table call from the button and the small blind. They were playing between 50 and 60% of hands. When they're getting involved that often, they're gonna have a lot of weak holdings. 
I'm in the big blind with jack seven off and feel like it's an appropriate time to go for the squeeze play. The cutoff's gonna have a wider range since it's opening in late position. The other two players could have almost anything. Well, it looks like a three bet's coming from Brad with a jack seven off. Ooh. He's got a little wiggle to his waggle. I like it. 250 also. <laughs> no one's going to be calling this one. Well, maybe he has a chance, Brad. Maybe he does. He's just fucking He's calling about with jack three suited yeah, and just getting you all shrink up I think Brad really bit. saw the spot think where Snuggy's calling too wide. Batiste hold right it. now is tilting and playing too many hands. Just, just had to get it from one guy. He was right. He was right. Great play by Brad Owen. Yeah. People sometimes say these bloggers are tight, but Brad Owen showing us a little bit of waggle. The next hand I'm showing because it sets up something that happens later on in the episode. Here, the under the gun player opens at 35. The hijack calls, who's been playing nearly everything. I have 7-5 suited in the cutoff, and I call as well. The flop comes 9-9-5 rainbow, so I flop two pair and have some backdoor draws. The under the gun player now fires for 60. Snuggy might call once, and then Brad is going to probably call as well, but have some caution. Jake's going to really need some help. Things have just not gone his way. Snuggy calls, and now Brad's going to overcall, understandably. Not loving it, but understandably. I mean, any card over a five, and it gives Jake a lot more outs against these hands, actually. Oh, a ten? Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Oh, but that is not a card over a five. Brad, nope. Brad feels up. feels a lot better now, uh, especially with Snuggy's call. Those two percent on the equity is just their chop outs, by the way. Brad, if a nine comes, the hand. That's yeah. right. Snuggy's gonna bet. It looks like. I guess he just he knows he's counterfeited. Yeah, he has three shot. high. Not crazy. <laughs> Giving himself a reasonable price to bet here. I bowed up on the turn, but I'm facing a bet of one fifteen from the hijack. I don't expect him to be bluffing in this spot against two players when I can certainly have a 9 or 5 after overcalling a flop bet on a dry board. I figure he probably has a 9 or 5 himself, and since there's only one 5 that's unaccounted for left in the deck, it's more likely I'm up against a 9. I put in a very small raise to 250. I'm not necessarily raising for value, but I'm trying to get to showdown as cheaply as possible and hedge my losses if I am behind. My thinking is that if I get re-raise, I can be reasonably certain that I'm up against a better boat and I can get away from the hand cheaply rather than calling a bet of 115 here and potentially having to call a much larger bet on the river. Sometimes the opponent may just flat with a 9, check the river hoping I'll bet, and I can check back as well, getting to showdown that way. If the opponent is bluffing, like in this instance, it's pretty unlikely he's going to fire again on the river, so I don't really lose value by raising when I'm up against those types of hands. It's a somewhat odd line, and you'll see both players fold. But the real reason I'm putting this hand in the episode is because the opponents and I all agreed that the winner of each hand has to show one card. Red shows the five. Red does not show like the show. seven, shows the five. That's interesting. That's a, he's trying to Nine get some credit for later, I guess. The announcers are absolutely right. I do want to build up some credit in case an opportunity comes up to bluff down the road. A short time after, the hijack opens up with 10-8 suited. The cutoff calls with queen-jack offsuit. He's the player who i just shown the full house to. I pick up jack-8 of hearts. And I prefer to 3-bet rather than call here usually, but I've been 3-betting a lot, I'm in position, my hand has a decent amount of potential, and we're pretty deep, so I just flat. Andrew comes along as well, we go 4 ways to the flop. Who do you think is going to win? Uh, I'm going to go with Brad Owen. No, I'm going to no, go with Snuggie. I, I would go with Snuggie if, <laughs> if I were... Hold on, I take Snuggie. <laughs> I mean, Brad does have the backdoor flush draw. He's got an open ender Still for the chop. Snuggie flops a straight, and it's checked to him. He bets 50. I've seen Snuggy play an extremely wide pre-flop range. I've also seen him make bluff attempts and multi-way pots. There's nothing in this hand so far that necessarily indicates he's super strong. I've got an open ender with a backdoor flush draw. I go for the raise to 160, hoping that I can take it down right away, but if not, I'm building a bigger pot in case I do hit my hand. Little do I know that I can't even win outright if I do make a straight. Also, it's worth noting at this time that I would play Queen Jack, Pocket Tens, Pocket Nines, King Ten, King Nine, and Ten Nine the same way up to this point, so I'll have a ton of value raises in my range. Too bad for me, I'm up against the nuts because I raise here and this that's is not, not going to work, work out. out. <laughs> that's, not, that's not going to go well for Brad. No, but he's going to have an easy fold. Do you think Snuggy can find a just call here, or do you think he's going to feel obligated to raise? I think it's very reasonable for yeah, him to raise, and I expect him to, to make people that mark new. I get stared down for a long time by 10 8 suited. But he looks like Brad must like just killed his family, yeah. and he's like, finally <laughs> found him. <laughs> It's like the end of The Revenant. Yeah, it's like, I finally got you, buddy. You're cornered. Sorry. Hey, now you will face my wrath. Eventually, Baptiste does lay his hand down. The action is back on Snuggy with a straight. 
He just flats, which is surprising to me. I don't expect him to do this with a strong, but very vulnerable hand out of position, since there are a lot of cards that could either kill the action for him or potentially pair the board and make the hand much more difficult for him to play. I don't think he'll do this with a straight or set. I mainly put him on two pair hands, one pair hands with gut shot straight draws, or potentially just a gutter with an over card like ace queen or ace jack. The turn is the ace of hearts, gives me the flush draw. My equity jumps from 10% to 22%, so it's a great card for me. Snuggy now leads for 210. It's less than a half pot size bet, and it's somewhat confusing to me. Seems like a blocker bet. I feel like I'm still up against ace queen, ace jack, king queen, king jack, king 10, or 10 9. I contemplate raising because I can still have the nuts in my range, and I feel it's unlikely that my opponent is going to have one himself. I'm getting a great price, and I have implied odds working for me too though, so I just call, hoping for a heart now. I don't get any help. The river is another 9. That does pair the board, so it's slightly frightening for Snuggy, but he's going to lead anyway. I like betting again. Snuggy bets 335. Not much I can do here. I've got nothing. I can only fold, and that's what I do. I fold. I fold, right? Well, Snuggy bet 38% a pot. I get the sense that he's afraid of something. I don't think he'll necessarily show up with a boat or a straight very often here. Me, on the other hand, I could certainly play full houses like this and on rare occasions, even Queen Jack. The last hand I played with Snuggy, I showed him that I raised him on the turn with a boat. That should have gotten me a lot of credit. He thought I was a nit before that, so I feel like it's a good time to cash in on my image. I pull the trigger and raise to 1100. Even if I do get called, I can't imagine a better situation to get caught bluffing. This opponent plays every hand that he can, and he's on my direct right. I'll have plenty of opportunities to get my money back from him if it does go poorly. And as you can imagine, Snuggy snap calls. Did he fold? I don't know. No, it looks like it was a call. No, he folded! Oh. Snuggy oh. folded! Just kidding. He snap folds face up. I can't bluff a player like this without showing him. I turn over the hand, hoping that it'll go off the rails a little. He takes it well at first, but his play definitely loosens up even more than it was before. We're in a great position to win lots of money. Why Brad Owen pulling the trigger there? That was strong. It was very strong. In this hand, we find ourselves in a similar preflop situation that we were in earlier. Wonka raises, but this time from early position with pocket 10s, so he's got a strong hand. Baptiste calls with pocket 6s. Snuggy calls with 8-5 offsuit. I pick up ace-4 diamonds. I want to get involved. And Brad Owen ain't going to fold either. Looks, that, that's like kind of the pause you always see before a 3-bet. And there it is, 200. I like the sizing a lot. Owen size is big in his 3-bets, and I like it too. He, uh... He gives himself real full deck, but he did this with kings as well as with uh, king queen before. So you know, with his ace four suited, so he's got real consistency to his sizing. It makes it tough. I mean, Wonka can't fold tens, but he already can't like his situation. It's a weird. It's going to be a weird stack to pot ratio thing already. He is folding. Wow. Well, wow. that means I got to believe everyone's going to fold now, right? He did open under the gun, and Owen decided to three bet anyway. And Owen has been getting his three bets through. If Wonka had seen some of the three bets, or if he had yeah. seen the four bet that Owen did against him, and yeah. Baptiste calls with the two sixes, by the way. I get the best hand to fold, but Baptiste does make the call with the sixes. I put him on a hand like the one that he's got. I expect him to have low to medium sized pocket pairs a ton of the time here. When the board comes 7-5-4, I'm not too pleased because it's a board that's much better for his calling range than it is for my 3-bet range. There are no high cards on the board, so my range is mainly going to only consist of one pair of hands at best. Baptiste checks. My hand has value. I'm ahead of all ace and king highs. I also have a backdoor flush draw and a backdoor straight draw that wouldn't be any good. I check because I don't think I'll be able to get any hands that are beating me to lay it down. Oh, that's a bad card for Batiste. Not only because Owen improves his equity, but also because Owen has a bunch of ace-king in his range. Yep. Owen's definitely going to continue here, and Batiste, I don't think, can fold with the open-ender and a pair. I think that would be a bad play. I don't no, expect he's, him to fold. he's getting 3-1 to one also. But Owen can... Oh, no, it's way, uh, it says 125. It's 225. Yeah. There's the call. Not a surprise, but Batiste is not going to like another barrel on the river, which I gotta believe is coming a lot. Well, Whoa. it's definitely coming now because Owen, Owen improves to what is almost always the best hand. We get a great run out, not only for our actual hand, but also for our perceived range. And Baptiste knows that kings and aces are not good for him once I three bet and check back the flop. He checks river with two pair. I'm certainly going to bet though. I don't anticipate getting called that often. I make it 500. 
Baptiste lets it go quickly. It's not a huge pot, but our stack is steadily increasing and we're up 1500 on the night. Now we're under the gun and we're not allowed to straddle, but by this point, most of the table is doing blind bets from this position. I put in a blind 40. Andrew is under the gun plus two. He raises to 120 with nine six suited. He's just trying to get involved and have some fun on the stream. Snuggy calls in the big blind with a six offsuit. And I defend with King Queen for 80 more as well. We go three oh, ways like to the we block. have some vlogger on vlogger action. And Snuggy, by the way, just gets in there with the A6 off. Let's get this shit rolling. For 110 more. Yeah, he had only put in 10. That's the uh, the effect of the drinks, I believe. And Brad flops best by a mile. I guess it's time to check call. A lot of the times, all three streets, depending on the runout. Andrew doesn't strike me as the type of guy who's going to triple barrel that often. Well, we're going to check call at least whenever Andrew bets. Let's see if he goes for it once here. It makes a lot of sense. It looks like he's betting about half pot. Something like that. Seems reasonable. This is a reasonably good flop for Andrew's range. Snuggy talking to the third player in the hand as he is clearly going to fold, but can take a little time with it. There it goes. Brad clearly not going to fold. And now here it is. We've all been waiting for this. I check call flop without suspecting the Andrew's weak at all. I don't exactly know where I'm at, but I'm probably not going anywhere. The turn is a nine, giving Andrew a pair. I check. Andrew now has a hand with some value, and he checks back. With this action, I'm going to have the best hand a lot of the time, so I'm not too worried. The river is the seven of hearts. I put out a small bet at 215. Andrew lets it go, so we win another one. There wasn't a ton of betting in this hand, but the blind 40 preflop turned it into a fairly large pot for us. Here I make it a blind 20 from under the gun, and a lot of people limp in. I've been re-raising quite a bit, which I think led to my opponents all flatting the 20, rather than raising it up, allowing me an opportunity to attempt another squeeze. It's good for me because I've only got 7-3 offsuit, and I'm happy to see a flop for no additional money. We end up going five ways to the flop. Software says, yeah. And uh, we got a pair and gut shot for Wonka here. Brad's got top and bottom pair. Snuggy's been having a rough go of it since the bluff earlier, and he leads out with a pair of fours for 50. I put in the raise to 150. I want to clear the field and get heads up with Snuggy in position. I get some hands with equity to fold. Snuggy doesn't want to be bluffed by me again. He makes the call drawing super slim. The turn is a nine. It shouldn't have changed much. Snuggy checks. I bet 300. And I get snap called by third pair, so it's pretty clear the opponent is after me. The river is a third club, which is a bad card for me. Snuggy checks. I check back. I sense he doesn't have much and would rather not show, so I turn my cards over without seeing his. Right. Brad saves Snuggy the embarrassment of turning over his hand by showing first, which he was not obligated to do. Yeah. Sure. Brad knows keeps guys like Snuggy happy at the yeah. table. Next, we pick up Queen Ten of Hearts in the cutoff. The under the gun player blind raises at 25. I raise to 70. The under the gun player calls with pocket eights, and we get a great flop. It's Queen Five Deuce with two hearts. We've got top pair and a flush draw to go with it. The opponent checks. I put out a small bet of 55. This induces a bluff from Kevin, who's been very active since he came into the game late. He makes it 125. I call for 70 more, and the turn is a six. Now the player checks, so. I figure I probably have the best hand, but if not, I should have plenty of outs. I bet 200, then Kevin calls pretty quickly. Same. I wonder if Brad thinks he's ahead or behind now. He knows he has a ton of equity, but yeah. I wonder if he thinks he's currently ahead. When Kevin checks so quickly on the turn, he may think he is ahead. I think we're just going to see check check, though. Uh, but I could go for some thin value against a guy who likes to call. Kevin checks the river, and I'm on the fence about what I should do. That's when I get what I perceive to be a live tell. It's very tough to hear since there's commentary over it, but if you listen closely, you'll hear Kevin say, I got you beat. I'm going to play it again. I think we're just going to see check check though. Uh, but I could go for some thin value against a guy who likes to call. You may notice the player in between Andrew and I hears it, and he reacts by swiveling his head to see what I'll do. I feel like the opponent is trying to induce a check from me because he probably has a marginal hand that has some value and wants to get the showdown for free. That verbal tell pushes me over the edge and gives me the confidence to go for thin value on the river. He's seen. Oh, he's, he's doing it. He has. This is he's, nice. He's seen I Kevin call. call really light before. Bam, and he gets oh, snap called. That awesome was nice by Brad. Well played. Shows the eights. He knew to go to, for value on the turn and river after getting check raised. It's so, maybe he thought like the six was a show, it was card that uh, turned a hard card to show down of hand or something like that for Kevin, because I don't know how he thinks he could get value. What he's supposed to get called by that check raise him on the flop, except. Things that turned into value on the turn, right? So unfair. Yeah, that was really good. A lot of people are going to check at least one of those two streets. Yeah. 
And that really adds to a, a great session so far for Brad Owen. Yep. But this is a, this is a story of the haves and the have-nots. All of the wins yes. and losses are significant. Yes. 170 blinds being the, the smallest deviation. And Brad Owen sort of pretty quietly up there, up $3,000. That's a nice night of work. He's had a lot of nice... Um, Cold three and four bets, mostly cold three bets. Some of them as bluffs, some of them not. And he just sort of negotiated this bit night very easily, it seems like, without too much trouble. Yeah. I mean, there's obviously some luck involved in that, but I think he's been playing quite well. The luck being that when you do three bet, a lot of the time he hasn't gotten any action with his light side hands because he's been <coughs> choosing the right time just based on the hands that his opponents had, which is a bit of luck there. Sure, he did three bet with kings and got no action then as well. But I hear what you're saying. He also, he make it for he also did early on four bet king queen against Wonka when Wonka had decent so that was not working out he lost $750 yeah. just in that hand yeah but still up 3000 that's the way to do it it's a good night in the last hand we'll go over the under the gun player blind raises to 20 Andrew raises to 60 from early position few players call I'm in the big blind with ace 5 suited it's 50 more to me I call and the under the gun player calls as well we go 6 ways to the flop go up with Batiste hates seeing that ace, but Brad flops it. Brad's the only one with one of those. Yep. Uh, Snuggy has a back door, two back doors, and a bottom pair. Anything else? Nope. Batiste has, of course, has two jacks still. Joseph has back door straight draw as well, but yeah. it doesn't really mean anything. Checks through a huge turn card for Snuggy. Picks up straight and flush draws. Yeah, that's a great turn card. And Owen, by the way, also picks up an open ender. Yeah. Gotta believe Snuggy's gonna bet this if checked to him. But I guess he was the first one, so he. Is it gonna just check through again? Wow. And breaking out. I don't feel incredibly confident that I have the best hand with a pair of aces, no kicker. But after it gets checked through on the flop and on the turn, there's a good chance I do. So I bet an amount that someone with a worse hand like a pair of 10s might be able to call. I put out 125. Folds to the button with pocket jacks, and he reasonably doesn't want to let it go for such a small bet. I mean, Batiste is getting a great price at least. Yeah, I think it's reasonable to call there for sure. Oh, he turns over the hand before Snuggy acts. Whoops. Snuggy now thinking, oh, this would be, this a would be sweet awesome. Raise. Sweet raise. Oh, Brad knows it too. Brad's sitting there like, don't raise now. I accidentally turn over my cards, not realizing there's another player involved. It's not clear to me whether or not Snuggy had seen my hand. He ends up folding, but it would have been interesting if he raised. It wouldn't make any sense for him to have a big hand and check all three streets. I didn't get the sense that Baptiste was very strong either, so I most likely would have called if Snuggy pulled the trigger. I'm happy with the outcome though, and I win one final time. The show ends, I didn't win any massive pots, but I had a good seat, and I picked spots using my image to book a win of over 3K on the night. That's it for this one, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please remember to hit the like and subscribe buttons. If you have any questions or comments, let me know in the comment section below, and I'm happy to get back to you. Also, remember to hit the bell next to the subscribe button. That'll make sure that you're notified every time I put out a new video. Uh, I want to give a big thanks to the poker guys. They're awesome. Some of the best commentators in the game. Uh, not only are they like super knowledgeable in poker, but they mix in a lot of humor too, which I appreciate. And uh, we just had a great time in Portland. Obviously, it's nice to win, but just everyone who played in the game was really friendly as well. So check out their YouTube channel. I'll have a link down below in the description box. Um, they, they have this show, and then they also do analysis of other poker hands. And uh, if you want to see every hand that I played during this session, uh, the poker guys are releasing, I think, videos every Tuesday in like 30 to 40 minute segments. So you can see the big hands that I played. Um, and big hands that other people got involved in, and you can you can listen to their commentary because I think it's really interesting. Um, also, be sure to join the the site PokerCoaching.com. I'll have a link down below in the description box for that. That'll get you two hundred dollars off a one year membership. So instead of two ninety seven, it's only ninety seven dollars, which is a great value. I mentioned earlier, it's one of the best ways to improve your poker game. I really believe that. Uh, also, if you sign up before October 7th, you get the 15 bonus stars, which will unlock three additional Jonathan Little videos that are worth $97 each. So definitely do that. 
And finally, I want to thank Jared with The Loft Hotels. He is a YouTube viewer and he hooks Andrew and I up with discounted hotels. I really appreciate it. Uh, it makes it a lot better for like these videos if I can travel around and not pay a ton of money. So uh, if you're ever going to Portland Meadows to play a session out there, hit him up and stay at the Hillsborough Loft. All right, hope you're all doing well. Good luck at the tables. See you next time.